praise God. Let's worship God together. Can you clap your hands with me and sing this song? Look what the Lord has done. Come on, everybody. Clap your hands.
no greater love than what Jesus has accomplished. You love me when I was so unloved. Thank you. 
Also pray for the Cassios, the Galvans, the Hearts, uh, and uh, Jesse and uh, Bethany Morales. Let's also pray for uh, the East Coast, Paul and Lily Campbell on the Cape. Let's also pray for uh, Chip and Lori Ganeer, the Suspanses, the Kings and the Spicers who are laboring in Jacksonville. Let's pray for God's help to them. Amen. Pastor Keith and Carrie Sullivan in Brighton. We're going to pray for our baptism on Sunday. Amen, that it's well attended, that people are making choices, they're going to live for God, they're going to do it in front of other people, amen, it's going to become a public event, hallelujah, and we're going to pray for those, amen, as they're making that decision in their lives, that they're going to live for Jesus till he comes back or till they take their turn in the pine casket, yeah. hallelujah. <laughs> Let's pray for those who are making that decision, let's pray for our movie night on Friday, that it is well attended that people can show up uh, and bring their friends and they can get saved. Let's go ahead and stand up together. We're going to believe God for uh, what he's going to accomplish in this service. Perhaps there's a need in your life that I did not mention. Amen. You need uh, God's intervention. God sees your hands as they're going up all over the place. Amen. We are a needy people. Jesus uh, did not promise our life to be like a bed of roses. Everything's going to be perfectly fine. You're going to be perfectly healthy. You're going to be perfectly uh, with enough money. He didn't ever promise that. He did say, though, that if you call upon my name, I will do great things for you. And we're going to believe God to, for miracles in your life especially. And as you would call out to God, and then God is going to help you. God sees your hands that are up. I'd like to also pray for our police officers and firefighters who are on the front lines serving our community. Amen. Let's pray for their success, their family's blessing. 
uh, a middle-aged guy by the name of Kyle, family guy who needs a church. I'm going to pray for Joshua and Annalise. That is a, a four-time veteran for the uh, uh, Army. Amen. We're going to pray for his family as they are going through things that they could become successful and have a breakthrough in their lives. Uh, we're going to pray for Carol Burdick, of course. Uh, she has an acute colitis. Amen. And we're going to pray that she can come out of the hospital and be completely well. Amen. Jesus' blood. And by his stripes we were healed, the Bible teaches us. So we have an opportunity right now to intervene in her behalf and pray for her complete healing. Uh, there's a, a woman by the name of Penny. We're lifting up Zach and Danielle. They have a newborn baby. We're going to pray for good choices in their lives. Also, Eric, uh, the contractor who I met at Home Depot yesterday. Amen. Let's pray for him to show up for church on Sunday and give his life completely to Christ and lock into this congregation. And lastly, Sheila. Amen. She broke her shoulder last week. She's in a lot of pain. I'm going to ask you to pray with me for her that God gives her a miracle to relieve her of the pain and that her uh, bones can completely and miraculously and spontaneously heal. Can anybody say amen? amen. You believe that with amen. me? Amen. We're going to pray together. Let's go ahead and pray and believe God for miracles. David, can you open this up with a word of encouragement when we subside? Let's pray, church. Can we stand up in here and give God the glory? God, we're asking you for great things, God. We're uh, coming into your throne room, Lord God. There's nobody like you to help us, to enable us, God, to intervene in our behalf, God. We're on our own. Without you, doctors don't have any answers, Lord God, in many situations, God. There's no cure for the cancer, Lord God. Intervene, help, and deliver from every wicked spirit, God. We're asking you for miracles tonight. I'm asking, I'm pleading with you by the blood of Jesus, God. Open every eye, Lord God, every heart soften, God. Work miracles, God. Give wonders, Lord God. Help our leadership, God. Help us to make an impact in our generation, God. Turn this place upside down for your glory, God. We're so thankful that we can come before you, God. And that we can ask you great things, God. We're believing you. Jesus, we we're know calling that on your mighty name, the only God. Thing will help all we ask, Lord, that you touch people so that they can... See their Maybe. sin, repent of it, turn to you, ask you into their life so that you can fill them with your spirit and give them yes. a new creation, Lord, oh, make yeah. them born of God. Because we know nothing else works, Lord. As long as we're just going on our yeah. our own merry way, it turns out to be not very merry. So we ask, Lord, that you <coughs> fill us with your spirit, that you baptize us with your spirit, yes. empower us to live this life you called us to. We thank you, Lord, that you're in us to make us willing and to make us able. And we ask that you do that, Jesus. In your name, amen. 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 Praise God. Let's worship God. That's a good prayer. Hallelujah. Amen. Make us willing and make us able. Hallelujah. I like that. That's pretty cool. Amen. Let's take a minute to greet one another. Make everybody feel welcome in this place. And greetings to you if you've joined us online, amen. We pray that God can touch your life tonight, amen.
Yeah, Christian, right in. Praise God. Great to have you in church. Amen. I'm glad that you're here. We're uh, going to make a few announcements for the local church, and that is this local church will be meeting on Sunday at 1030. If you can make it, uh, we're going to uh, be worshiping God at 1030. Amen. We also have a second service at night. That's 530 prayer and 630 worship and preaching. I have a special uh, sermon that I planned for Sunday night also. I'm going to encourage you to think about coming uh, next Wednesday. If it's you online, you're not aware that we have a midweek service. Praise God. Amen. Uh, whenever I hand out uh, our little postcards inviting people to church, they say, oh, you got a midweek service. That's cool. I can do that because I have to work on Sunday. And they uh, are interested in coming on Wednesday night as well. I'd like to also remind you about our uh, movie night this Friday. We're going to be showing a movie here, Tinseltown, Potter's House. Greece style, amen, bring your friends, uh, we're going to be meeting at 7 o'clock here, um, I will provide the popcorn, and praise God, and the soda pop for all you sugar freaks and Fanta freaks, praise God, amen, and for some of you some iced tea maybe, and there's plenty of water to go around always, amen, we also want to let you know about our baptism, we're plan baptizing a few people on this Sunday morning. If you'd like to be baptized, I'm going to ask you to contact me. Let me know that this is something that you're interested in doing. Uh, you've made a decision to live for Jesus and you're coming to this church. Uh, it would be a great, uh, effectual decision of yours if you would get baptized. As you're making a choice, you're going to live for God. You're going to go to this church. You're going to make this your home church. And... Uh, in line with that, too, goes your decision to tithe. Amen. If you want to call this, this is your church. Amen. I'm going to encourage you to begin to tithe to this church. Because God is uh, greatly interested in enhancing you and blessing you and meeting all your needs in your finances. But if you don't know how to give, amen, you're not going to know how to receive from God. And uh, we have... Uh, uh, some other interesting things coming up. Uh, also, I want to let you know that I'm here every morning praying for you and praying for Greece. You can join me if you'd like to at 8 o'clock. I pray for about 45 minutes. Amen. Every weekday morning. There's a marriage retreat on the 15th of September. If you're interested in going to that, we're also looking forward to an impact team I would like to send to Troy, New York. That is when we're going to take the car or take a couple cars, as many cars as we can fill and we're going to go to one of our sister churches and uh, help them to reach their city. And then that's what we do as a fellowship of churches. And I praise God. If uh, there's no other announcements, I would like to take our offering. May I praise God. This is all about the silver and the gold. Anybody own any gold bars in here by chance? Yeah. Yeah. There's some of you have never seen silver, although maybe some of you have a fancy watch or a beautiful necklace, or maybe an expensive ring, there's gold in it. Yep. Amen. And we don't really in our culture see much gold and silver, but here, this was a thing of commodity as they were building precious things for the uh, temple. First uh, Chronicles 28, 14 through 18. He gave gold by weight for things of gold for building the temple, for all articles used in every kind of service, also silver, for all articles of silver by weight, for articles used in every kind of service, the weight for the lampstands of gold, and their lamps of gold by weight, each lampstand and its lamps for the lampstands of silver by weight, all kinds of silver and gold that they devoted to the, the candlesticks, the lampstands, and the worship of God. And by weight, he gave the gold for the uh, tables of the showbread. I believe everything was gold plated. Like we could dunk this pulpit right here in gold, liquid gold, and it would become gold, solid, pure gold, and refined gold by weight for the altar of incense and for the construction of the chariot. There was a chariot, uh, the, uh, the cherubim, and the angels that were on top of the mercy seat. Everything was gold. It was a very expensive way of worshiping God. Amen. It sounds like an expensive process for worshiping God. And I want you to think this evening about your worship of God. What are you willing to give to God as an, a sign 
or a token of your appreciation for what God has done in your life. I want to get you to think about that. Can I have David to come forward? We have an opportunity to give, amen, and invest in things that are not of this world, my friend. This world is slowly passing away and shifting. It's not going to be here for long. You're not going to have any time after uh, the, the, the age is over to give to God and to make an investment in your mansion in glory and into the souls of of uh, men and women and that's the mission of this church is to preach go on outreach get people saved make flyers pay for this glorious building we have here and the beautiful cool temperature that we all enjoy and this is for you amen that you can come closer to god and realize who jesus is amen david can you bless the offering yeah lord we thank you for the opportunity to give especially as we get oh, to the end oh jesus help us not that much longer that we can give. We'll be with you at that point. So we ask, Lord, that you give us grace to be generous and share with you what you shared with us. And we ask, Lord, that you bless the offering for your purpose. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you for your offering. And if you're online, you can click the link if you'd like to make your tithe or your offering for this service. Uh, maybe you're interested in giving a pledge because you really feel that this ministry is helping your life. It's helping your marriage. It's helping you to uh, in a, be less anxious to overcome your fears and every obstacle. And I'm going to challenge you to give tonight and give to God out of a heart of appreciation. Amen. Praise God. Thank you for your giving. Uh, if you brought your Bibles along, we're going to start our service now. And this is from Matthew 16, 13 through 20. Amen. Praise God. We're going to read that in a moment here. But first, I would like to, by way of illustration, give you a quote. I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying really foolish things that people often say about him. I am ready to accept Jesus as a good moral teacher, but I don't accept him in his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg. Or else he would be the devil of hell himself. Yep. You must make your choice. The quote goes on. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman. Yep. Or something worse than a madman. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit on him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let each one of us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great uh, human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. That's a quote by C.S. Lewis. I want to engage your mind and think with me about this topic this evening. Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Now he's shifting the emphasis. It's out there for the general opinion, the general topic, the, uh, the consensus of the public eye. Because Jesus has been doing miracles. He's been preaching. He's been ministering for years. And now he focuses it on his real intention 
and that is to discover where the heart of his disciples truly are. The masses, the crowds, they love the, the loaves and the fishes. They love the, to see Jesus do milk. Wow, Jesus, that was crazy, wild. How did you do that? They love to see his miracles. The dead are being raised to life. And the crippled are able to walk. And it's so totally radical, cool. Wow, Jesus, we really dig you, man. But here, Jesus is asking his disciples specifically, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. I got inspired to preach this sermon entitled Jesus. I want to look this evening at the personhood, who Jesus really is, who men say Jesus is, who uh, God says Jesus is, who Jesus says Jesus is, and I want to poignantly direct the attention in this service to you. I want to proverbial get in your face. And ask you personally, one by one, who do you say Jesus is? Because that's going to change everything for your life. It's going to change everything. Who do you say Jesus is? Proverbial question. This will settle everything in your mind. Your doubts, your fears, your anxious. You can't handle life. You can't handle yourself, perhaps. If you really did believe Jesus is the Christ, then you would be willing to live for him. Can you say amen? You'd be willing to die for him, wouldn't you? If he truly is what the Bible says he is, I could even like go through the Bible and be here for days looking at everything the Bible says about Jesus. But we're going to look at a few items here. I'm not going to keep you too long, of course. You would be willing to do anything he asked. Jesus, where do you want me to go? Yeah. What do you want me to do with my life? If you settled it in your heart this evening, once and for all, you would want to see him, amen, with all your heart, all your mind, everything you got, you would give it to him. Let's firstly look at who do men say Jesus is. And current men, uh, there's a few here that I want to look at, and this is uh, in a general thing for Americans, and this is from uh, 2020, from a newswire, a new survey reveals that 52% of American adults believe that Jesus was a great teacher and nothing more. And this man adds here in his little uh, quote, but if Jesus claimed to be God is false, then he has either been delusioned or is deceptive. But he could not have been a great teacher. So the two don't go together. You can't think or believe the two are true. Elon Musk. And if everybody know who Elon Musk is, raise your hand. Yeah. Right? Very important guy. Very smart, significant feature in our generation. 
Let's find out what Elon Musk says about Jesus. Can you say amen? Some of you may have seen this interview. Uh, Tesla co-founder and CEO Elon Musk recently shared his thoughts about Jesus Christ <laughs> and religion during an interview with a satire website called The Babylon Bee, a Christian group podcast. They discussed politics. They discussed wokeness and the rich. Near the end, Musk made a joke about the interview taking place on Sunday. Of course, we know Sunday to be the Lord's Day. Thank you. Sunday's the Lord's Day. It's when yeah. Jesus rose. It is the central day of the week. And so they're having a podcast on Sunday. So Elon Musk, God bless him, man. He's right on the money. He says, well, we really shouldn't. Shouldn't you guys be in church, he said to them. And um, so uh, he was telling the bees editors that they're all going to hell for not being in church on Sunday. That's a joke. You can smile, okay? You're not going to hell if you're not going to be there on Sunday. No, don't get the wrong message here. But that's when the interview turned toward real questions about salvation. And Nicole said, slightly tongue-in-cheek, but his overall tone indicated that he wasn't joking. Babylon B is a Christian organization, and we're a ministry. To make this a church, uh, we're wondering if you could do us a quick favor and solidly accept Jesus in your heart as your Lord and Savior. It's a quick prayer. So Musk sat there, and he was stunned for a few seconds. Then he responded, I agree with the principles that Jesus advocated. There's some great wisdom with the teachings of Jesus, and I agree with all those teachings. In other words, he agrees. Jesus was a great teacher. That's it. Stop right there. So then he continues, I like the thing that Jesus said. He turned, turned the other cheek. Those are very important as opposed to an eye for an eye. Uh, and an eye for an eye leaves everyone blind, he said. Very clever. Forgiveness is important in treating people as you wish to be treated. Love your neighbor as yourself. He even said it in the old King James, love thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus is actually quoting the Old Testament, some of the Mosaic law, but hey, if Jesus is saving people, I mean, I won't stand in his way, Musk said. Like you can stand in the way of God? <laughs> Who is this? Who does he think he really is? <laughs> Musk says, sure, I'll be saved. Why not? So that doesn't sound like much of a confession. Can you say amen? He's not really serious about it. It's just, he's been brought to this location and it's like, eh, whatever. Like picking up, what, is he going to have broccoli or is he going to have carrots this week? That's not that kind of decision, my friend. Kind of patronizing. Not much of a confession, and of yet we need to see a repentance, and that means that his life is devoted to, you know, Jesus. Many in that day will say, "But Lord, Lord, weren't we with you in the streets when you were healing the sick and you were opening the deaf ears? We were there with you." And Jesus is going to say, "I never knew you. Depart from me." You got to do. You got to know. Think about that. Jesus said that a relationship with him is everything. Bible days, man, there was regular people and they saw Jesus doing all these incredible miracles and they asked a very poignant question. They said, when the Christ comes, will he do more miracles than this man? The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about Jesus. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. Jesus said, I am with you for only a short time, and then I will go to the one who sent me. Right. Regular people. That's their opinion of it. They're thinking about, it. you know, who is this? Is this really? Is this God? Wasn't God going to send us a warrior-like Messiah? One who is going to uh, destroy all the the uh, the Romans who are uh, 
controlling us who have overrun our nation. They're looking for somebody different. But Jesus is kind of meek and lowly. He's kind of just like a carpenter, uh, you know, like just a regular guy. Jesus' family also had a problem with him. Mark 3, verse 20. Who did, what, who did, the, who did Jesus, let me put this the right way, what did Jesus family say about him? What did they believe about him? In Mark 3, verse 20, Then Jesus went home again, and a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples could not even eat dinner. When the, his family heard about this, they went up to take custody of Jesus, and said, He's out of his mind. This is what his family thought about Jesus. This is what they believed about him. Now, I'm pretty sure it wasn't his mother, but all his brothers, his brothers in John 7, 5. John tells us here that not even his brothers believed in him. Can you imagine that? Mm -hmm. After Jesus' death, though, his brothers did believe. In Acts 1, 14, it says, These all continued in one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. They finally came on board. They finally said, you know what, Jesus, if, if my brother can rise from the dead, I'm going to believe on him. I'm going to serve him as the Christ. And they were in there, gathered in the upper room with all the other disciples, 120 of them, waiting on Pentecost. What did Jesus' neighbors say about him? Some of you got that app, the Next Door app. Anybody got Next Door? Yeah. Right? You see about somebody missing a dog. So this, if somebody found a cat, you know, all these stupid things. And uh, what do your neighbors say about you, Jesus? Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor. <coughs> that means he does have honor, except in his hometown. Matthew 13, 53, now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all the parables of teaching, that he departed from there, and when he had come into his own country, he taught in the synagogue, so that they were astonished, and they said, where did this man get this doctrine, this wisdom, and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary, and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us here? Where did this man get all these things? And so they were offended at him. He couldn't figure it out. And then and this is where... Uh, they were mocking Jesus. And because they had no faith in Jesus, he could not do many miracles there. This might be true for the church kids here. I mean, my, my sons, my daughters, my, my own kids. They, they, you know, they grow up with me and they've got to see me. They've got to see dad's preaching, you know what I'm saying? They've they got to have a, a faith. They gotta, it's a little bit harder than you to know your father, right? It's the pastor. <laughs> this is the kind of thing, and the Bible says that there's a phrase, I don't think it's in the Bible, but it's summed up in this whole ideology, familiarity breeds contempt. Right. And so Jesus' neighbors were not sure what to believe with him because of their preconceptions of him, of their history with him, of him growing up. Jesus, you know, he's, he's a little hellion, you know, he's... <laughs> He's uh, letting uh, the sheep go out of the gate or something. and I don't know when Jesus did that, right? The Pharisees and the Sadducees were the rulers, uh, religious rulers of the day. And they had an opinion about Jesus too. Matthew 12, 24, but when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. They hated Jesus with a passion, man. That's one thing. One thing that they were very good at, and that was destroying the Savior. They hated him because he healed on the Sabbath day. And the Sabbath day was their special day, their holy day that, uh, you know, you're not supposed to clean any pots and there's no chores to be done and blah, blah, blah. But uh, he spent time with sinners and Gentiles. This really ticked him off. That Jesus was able to sit with the harlots, the prostitutes, and the publicans, which were the tax collectors. Some of you, uh, you know, there's no way you would 
uh, go out and associate with certain people and tell them about Jesus, talk to them and witness to them because of who they are. But Jesus was a friend. They called him a friend of sinners. They called him a wine bibber and a glutton. Jesus didn't follow their traditions and the rules that they set up. They made them up. So they simply rejected him from being the Christ. This can't be the Christ. He's breaking too many of the Mosaic laws and they're keeping track of Jesus. Not realizing that here before them, it's God in the flesh. Amen. And every page in the Torah and the Pentateuch and in the Old Testament, the prophets are all pointing to Jesus. A Messiah is coming. There is someone who is going to deliver and save Israel. And it's found in the personhood of Jesus. Jesus shows up. The Jews, they're still waiting for their Messiah. The ones that truly believe. Most Jews are only Jew, Jewish by custom or by race. But the true Jews are still waiting. They're, they've been praying for the Messiah to come. Hallelujah. Who does Jesus say he is secondly? Matthew 11. Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We can learn about Jesus by what he says about himself. He says, I am meek. And that doesn't mean he's weak or limp-wristed. Um, he was a carpenter. He was probably, you know, had some muscles on him. But he was meek in that he had power under control. I'm sure he wanted to lash out at those uh, religious Pharisee creeps who were constantly, you know, doing evil things and trying to deceive him and get him off track. But he was lowly, he was a servant. And Jesus called himself the good shepherd. Jesus said, Jesus is a good shepherd in John 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd, he said. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who does not uh, uh, act as the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep alone and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and he doesn't care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. And I know my sheep and my sheep are known by me. And as the Father knows me, even I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have that are not of this fold, I must also bring, and they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. I am the good shepherd. There's only one shepherd, only... <clears throat> One cares for you like Jesus that was willing to lay down his life for your life and mine. Verse 17, therefore my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. The command I received from my Father. Jesus is demonstrating his love for us. And while we were yet sinners, he died on the cross. He shed his perfect blood as the innocent Lamb of God. Perfectly spotless. Without sin. Taking our sins off of us and upon himself. He laid his life down. <clears throat> man as a shepherd. Jesus allows people to worship him. Think with me. Stay with me for a minute here. Worship means reverence is being paid to a divine 
being. And this man wrote this idea of Jesus was offered and accepted worship. Then by doing so, he was confirming his divinity. Let's look at a few times when Jesus was worshipped by people. We can start with the Magi as uh, Jesus is being born in a manger. Amen. And the, the Magi, those are the men from the East, the wise men. They bring gifts, frankincense and myrrh and gold. And they offer it to Jesus and they bow down to him in the room where they found the child. Jesus accepted worship as the second person of the Trinity. He was... And still is worshipped. Amen. Is it possible Jesus was a lunatic? Claiming to be God. There, you can look in the news. You can look online. There's many people who think they are the Christ. Jim Jones thought he was God in the flesh. Many other people throughout the world. It's a guy in Russia who thinks he's Jesus. Who's got a giant flock. They have a giant community. I don't know if you've ever studied that. Have you? No. There's many people who call themselves the Christ. Jesus considered himself to be equal to God. One time they, they had confronted Jesus and, you know, they got an argument with him and he said, before Abraham was, I am. Yeah. <laughs> and that's when they looked, started looking for stones. Bless for me, you liar! And they were ready to whoa, whoa. hit Jesus and destroy him and stone him. <laughs> because that was blasphemy for their religion. He said, I am who I am. That's exactly what God said. Praise God. Think about Legion, the demoniac. Mark 5, 6, when Legion, a guy who was possessed with demons, not your boss, not your spouse, <laughs> not that kind of demoniac, but this guy ran when he saw Jesus. And he ran and he ran and he ran at Jesus and he fell at his feet and worshipped him. What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. Even this one bows in his presence. Many people are hesitant to worship God. They're hesitant to lift up their hands and sing out to God his praises that he deserves in a church service. But here we see this demoniac because of his humility. He's able to tap into God's miracle working power and every last demon is cast out of him. He's sitting in his right mind with Jesus. He knows who Jesus is. He knows that Jesus just gave him that miracle. Who does the Father say Jesus is? God the Father! Let's find out what his opinion is of Jesus. My beloved Son, firstly. Matthew 3.16, when Jesus had, excuse me, when, yeah, when Jesus had been baptized in the water, Jesus came up immediately out of the water and behold the heavens were open to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him and suddenly a voice came from heaven this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased you can hear that thundering everybody heard it amen and God was pleased with his son. He calls him Jesus. My son. This is the son of God. Father God that we have. And then he also. Says that I am pleased with my son. This is even before Jesus did any miracle. Before he uh, performed the miracle at the wedding of Cana. And where he made uh, the water into wine. Before he healed any demoniac or any dead person or any person who couldn't speak who was mute, anybody who had any disease the lepers, before he did all of that, Jesus God says I am pleased with you, my son this is amazing because think with me for a moment here 
All Jesus did was get baptized in water. This is a monumental event for God and his son Jesus. Because he realizes that Jesus is obeying his father. He's following through with the father's plan. He then became a man and then lived for 30 years as a regular person. And at the age of 30 begins his ministry and starts ministering his father's message, preaching and teaching and healing and casting out devils. God calls him, my beloved son, hear him. It's very important to you and I, amen, if we are going to know Jesus, for us to hear him, amen. Here's the letter that he penned for you and I. Every scripture in here is meaningful to you and I so that we can know Jesus. You can start if you're a new Christian, if you're uh, born again recently in the past couple months or maybe this year. To find out who Jesus is, you can start reading the book of John. John was Jesus' best friend, his beloved. And he had such a great close uh, interaction with him and John's uh, gospel is completely different than the other gospels, the other stories about uh, Jesus' interaction with the disciples. And you should start with that, amen, and find out who Jesus is for yourself. I want to ask you one last question this evening. Who do you say that Jesus is? Because if you answer that the wrong way, then you're going to miss everything. But if you answer it the right way, your life is going to radically be transformed. Man, you're not just here for a girl. You're not looking for a husband or a wife. Or you're not here to just waste time on a Wednesday night. Uh, you're just not just trying to be religious. But you really certainly do believe that God is gave us Jesus. The main question this evening is directed at you personally. And if you're feeling a little uncomfortable, that's okay. Because this is a big decision for you. Who do you say Jesus is? If you resolve to believe in God, that Jesus came in the flesh and he's the savior of the world that he died for your sins that his blood was perfect you can be completely saved and this life will pass like a vapor and one day amen you're going to take your turn in that pine box and they're going to say nice things about you at the funeral and uh, you know people are going to lie through their teeth <laughs> right but really, the bottom line is, do we have a relationship with God? And where will we spend eternity? It all hinges on this whole sermon this evening. Who do you say that I am? The gospel is good news for those who are saved. Those who do believe. Those who are completely surrendered to the living God. If you're going to dabble in the world a little bit, Party, go to the clubs, you know, have some booze, party, sleep around, and then come to church. You're living in two worlds. It's not going to work, my friend. It's like oil and vinegar. They don't, you can shake it up and shake it up, but really, it, it just separates in the end. Amen. And you will be a miserable Christian if you're going to be a party animal, if you're going to still live in sin and pursue that lifestyle. You'll be a, lit, a lousy Christian. Or if you're going to try to be a Christian and you've got sin in your life and you keep going back to it, it's, you've got to make your choice, man. You can't live in two worlds. Jesus said about money uh, and serving mammon that uh, you either love the one and hate the other or you'll, you know, you'll respect one and you'll disrespect the other. You have to choose and make a decision. And I hope to God that before you walk out the door, you've made your peace with who Jesus is in your own heart. I'm not here, 
I'm not going to harp on you. I'm not going to uh, force you to sign a creed or a document. But, man, that would really help you to just get on board, to just surrender completely. Why would you waste any time? Right? And pray and just believe to the best of your ability that God is going to take care of you. He's going to help you. He's going to reveal things to you. And that's the only thing that you're lacking, and that is revelation. That's why we're here. That's why I preach this gospel. That's why me and my family have been ministering here in Greece. All for your edification, for your salvation, for your spiritual man inside to become strengthened and whole. Are you completely surrendered to the living God? Do you believe that Jesus is exactly who God says he is? The Christ, Son of the Living God. Why don't we bow our heads, Amen, in a sign of respect to everybody here? And uh, I want to give an altar call. This is more than a religious event, or a, a more than just a portion of our uh, liturgy, or this is the way we do things. But this is really critical this evening, and I want to give you an opportunity to pray this evening, to give your life to Jesus. Maybe you've never answered an altar call before. Maybe you've never come forward and prayed, but maybe God is just revealing something to you this evening, amen. And as it were, it's the apocalypse, that Greek word that means God is drawing back the curtain in your behalf so that you can see into the spiritual realm. You can see down the road. You can see heaven in a distance. You can see... Uh, back 2,000 years ago, God has shown you that Jesus was really a man who was crucified. They killed Jesus. And he died there for your behalf. Amen. So that his shed blood will become a payment for your sin. So that you could have a new life. You could be able to respond to him. Surrender your life to Jesus tonight. I'm begging you to become reconciled to God. That means to repair that, that damage that your sin has separated you or maybe your thought life and things that you're involved in has separated you from God. Because God can't live in your heart if you're going to let sin live there. You can't let it be there. You have to deal with it. And I'm going to challenge you tonight to give your life to Jesus. Amen. You're not saved. You know that God loves you, died for your sins, and you want to make a choice. You want to go on record tonight. I am going to live for God because Jesus is the Christ. This is not to embarrass anybody, but this is to simply get you uh, on track, amen, to give you a wake-up call, perhaps, and to give you some incentive to answer this altar call to believe God and to watch your life completely be transformative. This sermon can make the difference. This can be a game changer for you. If you want to get saved, lift up your hand right now. You want to pray and give your life to Jesus. You're not sure about tomorrow. You're not sure about uh, if you would d to die in a car accident or, or anything bad could happen. God forbid that anything, any disease would come upon you. But that you would not be ready for standing before him, amen. That you would not be ready for the rapture should he come before the end of your life. And then and you want to get right with God. I'm going to ask you to lift up your hand. Maybe you're a backslider. Maybe you were once on track, but now you are not doing what God is doing, amen. You're not going his way. And there's no shame in answering a backslider call, amen. Because it's it could be it could be it could be monumental in your Christian experience to realize that you are not right with him. And in God's presence, I'm gonna challenge you to lift your hand and uh, pray. If there's one here, amen, maybe a whole row of you would like to pray. On, online, maybe that's you, you're feeling the conviction of heaven and God's reaching out to you. Be reconciled to me, he's saying. Get, right, get on your knees right now and start praying and watch God change everything about your life. Who do men say that I am? 
who do you say that I am? Amen. Praise God. Is there anyone who would like to pray? Amen. Praise God. Let's go ahead. We're going to open up the altars right now. You can look up and sing the song with me. Uh, we can do one of these songs here. Let's try this one. You are holy. Amen. He's worthy of being worshipped. Amen. Let's stand up and sing this song together. I saw the Lord. Smile yourself. 
Does that hurt? Yeah. Okay. Let's go ahead and pray and ask Jesus to touch you right now. Pray this prayer of you. Say, uh, Lord Jesus, I believe you, that you love me, that you died for my sins, and you died for my body, so I could be healed right now. I forgive all those who have offended me, and I break the curse of rejection. And I thank you for your blood. Right now, do me a small favor. Take all this pain away in my shoulder. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray, church. Loose you right now by the blood of Jesus, God. We thank you, God, for your power, God. Demonstrate it right now, God. Have mercy, God. Show grace and favor, God. And touch and heal completely this shoulder so that the pain, pain I speak to you, you must leave right now in Jesus' name and never come back. Amen. You're gone. Goodbye. <laughs> Praise God. We need to please check it out. You guys believe that? Hallelujah. Let's push it down. Go ahead. Check it. It's gone. It's gone. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you. Amen. Let's go ahead and worship it down one last time. Brother David, can you bless us as we leave for the week? Amen. Praise the Lord. I pray that you do bless us. Touch us by your spirit. Make your presence known to us as we go out of here so that we're aware that we're just not people wandering on our own, but that we are people who belong to you as part of a kingdom. We ask, Lord, that you show us what to do by your spirit. Yes. Make your ways known. Make your presence known to us as we go out this week. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah.